Well, welcome to a Trek Zone conversation as I continue to wait for Alec to fit our podcast into his schedule. Dean Newberry is beaming in to chat about his time on the Star Trek fan film. Dean, thanks for your time. Thank you, Matt. This is a Trek Zone conversation. And you can get exclusive behind-the-scenes info and first-play access to all Trek Zone podcasts by becoming a member today. Click join on every Trek Zone video on YouTube. Go to the trek.zone slash support or scan the QR code on screen throughout the show. Now, it's back to you, Matt. Well, thank you very much, Ross. And a quick mention of our socials, Trek Zones on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and your favorite podcast feed. Find us, like, follow, and subscribe. Leave comments and ratings, and that'll help us convince the algorithm we're worth it. Dean, let's start with your background. You've worked in the art department on a number of quality productions, including Star Trek Renegades, I believe. Uh, how did it all come about for you? Where did you get started in the industry? Well, I'm not currently in the industry. I guess I, guess I should probably make that clear. Um, I'm actually back to being a union, union carpenter. I'm in construction again. Um, that's where I actually started uh, as a carpenter. Um, it's about 2009 or 10. I started working on student films, uh, uh, AFI, uh, American Film Institute, as well as uh, I did uh, some USC student films. And that's sort of a, you're not getting paid much, if anything, and it's just your foot in the door. You get to know some students and they like you and they uh, they take you onto their projects. And that's where I got started in the industry, um, low or no pay, uh, kind of common. Um, but you know, I, I thought of it as like an internship and it was well worth it because I, uh, the kind of carpentry you do on sets is uh, a fair bit different than uh, what you would do, say, in the construction industry. And uh, I actually learned a lot um, along the way, particularly on Axonar, because that was, um, as you can imagine, a very um, intricate and difficult project. Um, had never done a like, carpentry quite at that level or for as, you know, as long, like a sustained period. Because I think I was on it for almost a year straight working on those sets. Um, and then, yes, you're correct. I, I did work on uh, quite a few cool things, actually. Um, uh, the I haven't been working in the industry for oh, roughly two years now, three years maybe. Uh, but the last few things, I did a few Marilyn Manson music videos. Was some of the last stuff I did. And that was a lot of fun. Um, my mother was horrified at both of them, so I think we did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I've got I got to work with a lot of interesting people over the years. Um, and I did do one day on Star, Star Trek uh, Renegades, actually. Um, that's true. Um, I got to eat lunch with Walter uh, Koenig, so that was kind of neat. <laughs> nice. Nice. Very cool. Well, what drew you to Axena? Well, I've known Alec uh, Peters for, I'm going to say, roughly 15 years. I'm not sure exactly how long. I, I met him at Comic-Con, San Diego Comic-Con, years ago, uh, prior to the, uh, the BSG auctions that he did through PropWorks. And then uh, we became friends uh, through uh, our fan group, the Colonial Fleet. It's a Battlestar Galactica uh, fan group. Um, spent a lot of time at, at Dragon Con together. And uh, eventually, though, I was actually hired by another friend, uh, David Reed. He was running the uh, Stargate, Stargate auctions for ALEC. And um, it was at a time, uh, uh, that was also around the time I started the film in the film industry, uh, roughly 2009 to 2010. Uh, economy was in a bad spot at that point and I wasn't really working. And so, uh, Dave needed some help with Stargate and I'm also uh, well-versed in that fandom. So it was actually a really good match. Uh, we partnered well together. We did those auctions together. We wrote the catalogs and all the eBay auctions and it was a lot of fun. Um, didn't pay terribly well, but you know, there's sort of a, you know, a, a give and take there, right? Like I was in an 8,000 square foot warehouse full of Stargate stuff, which was amazing. And in the other warehouse, we we were just right when I got hired, we were about to do the Iron Man one auction. So, you know, like the real Iron Man was, you know, around like that was pretty cool. You know, like all in all, the job was was a lot of fun. PropWorks was a really fun place to work at for sure. And from there with PropWorks, um, you came on board Axena. Uh, I guess sort of talking a little bit about Alec, knowing him for a longer than uh, when you were with Axena. So I guess he sort of. So how, how did it sort of move from there? He saw that you were a carpenter and, and could use your skills um, pretty much? Well, gosh, let me think back. Um, I don't remember when exactly he started talking about the idea of Axonar. It was pretty early. 
Um, I remember he sent me a script in an email long, long time ago. And then I think he really started talking seriously about it right around the time he was doing his anime cons. Because I remember he was still friends with Vic Mignogna at that point. And Vic was at that at first uh, Anime World Chicago, I think it was. I think that's what he called it. Um, and Vic was doing, uh, that was the early episodes of Star Trek Continues. And so Alec was all about, you know, Garth this, Garth that. And he got people at that convention to bug Vic about it. Like it was a whole thing. Um, and slowly but surely, uh, Axanar started becoming a reality. First it was Prelude. Uh, I was invited onto that, but I didn't work on it. But I was definitely being talked to about uh, building the sets. Um, the studio wasn't even a conversation at that point. But uh, he wanted me to work uh, on the sets. And then at some point, Curtis Lassiter, uh, who built the, Battle the Babylon 5 sets, um, he came on board when we actually started building the, the studio build out and the Axonar sets. So I, initially, I was uh, his uh, number two, I guess, or number one. <laughs> I don't know if we want to stay in Star Trek parlance, right? Um, and so when we were actually in the studio, uh, Curtis actually had to leave. I mean, he was a union um, uh, film, you know, film guy, and he uh, eventually had to go out and do actual union projects because he had benefits and things he had to worry about, you know, family and stuff like that. So he had to maintain his medical benefits and stuff. And I, I mean, and I, you know, we were on a low budget, so you know, he, he needed the extra pay. I totally understand that, you know. And uh, so from there, I became the construction coordinator. Uh, for Axonar. And in the beginning, what was that like? Uh, you know, things things were on the on the up and up and, and things were going really well for the production. Uh, sets were being constructed. A studio, for better or for worse, was happening. I'm guessing, too, that this was pre-Alex lawsuit with CBS and Paramount. Uh, yes, this was early 2015. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly. I, I think it was mid-January of 2015. I, I was actually... Uh, driving out to Santa Clarita from my house. It was a 70 mile drive one way uh, through Los Angeles traffic, which if anybody knows anything about LA, that's not a fun time. Uh, and uh, initially we were talking about the sets, but what we really started working on was a studio. So that included everything from converting the warehouse itself uh, into a sound stage and working on the uh, offices and the dressing rooms and those sorts of things uh, in that space. Uh, so I actually developed blueprints uh, for him uh, for the offices and stuff. And um, he eventually took those blueprints and turned them into a, a real architect who was able to develop them. I mean, that, those everything was, and then you talk about, yeah, everything was on the up and up. I mean, he submitted those things to the city. He got permits. You know, we were doing metal stud framing and drywall, which was really my original trade um, before, you know, film. So that was interesting. And, um, you know, building out those offices. Uh, and, uh, sometime after that, uh, Curtis Lassiter actually came, he brought this big trailer full of all his tools or two trailers, actually full of his tools and equipment. And, uh, we started on the, the studio build from there. And, uh, I think it was at the point we got the, um, the sound, the, the flooring done for the sound stage. We, we did a, a really nice soundproof wood floor and we built these big things he called elephant doors to go over the warehouse uh, doors, you know, so that we could soundproof those. And I, I think from there, after we got that stuff done, uh, there were some other things in process, but then we started working on the sets together. And Curtis Lassiter was there. Uh, we almost had the, um, the foundation of, of the bridge built. We had all the wedges built. We had them up on wheels. And at the point he had to leave, we were, we were doing the, um, the fi finishing touches on that. Um, and then sometime after that, I, I got a couple of guys, I had my crew together and we actually started standing up actual, you know, bridge pieces. It, it was, and it was a lot of fun. It was so much fun. Uh, we got to, we were building Star Trek. You know, the first, first thing we built was the turbo lift door and uh, or the, or like sort of the alcove, not the door itself, but you know, the alcove. And then from there we, we were going uh, counterclockwise. The first station we built was Ohura's uh amazing you know i guess i don't know if people may not know the exact like goal that we have but we were building a tos bridge because the idea was it was in the same era and if we need wanted to convert it over to say kirk's bridge we would be able to do that because it mostly 
the same the details were all there we, you know a paint job and you know swap out some trans lights and keyboards and we'd have Kirksbridge you know because the of course the idea was eventually maybe we would be shooting other fan films or who knows what else um I mean, I, we, there was a, it was a lot of fun. There was a lot of pie in the sky talk about like, um, I know Bing Bang Theory did a, did a Star Trek thing on some bridge somewhere. I, I think that was the case. So we, we were seeing things like that happening. It was like, well, we could do it here. You know, we, we, if somebody needs a, a Star Trek bridge, here it is, you know, right? Like it was a, there was a lot of ideas there. And it was, they could have been a lot of fun, you know, it had everything, you know, gone correctly. All of this for a Star Trek fan film, did it ever sort of play into your mind at the time that this was just a Star Trek fan film and it wasn't a union job necessarily, it wasn't uh, anything major? Um, was there any sort of hesitation from you um, putting all this effort in in LA? No. I mean, one, it was a kind of, it was a very cool project. Um, and, and as a carpenter, I mean, you know, all the other issues aside, as a carpenter, the idea of building the bridge of the TOS Enterprise was amazing. I mean, even if I wasn't a Star Trek fan, which I am, but I mean, just from the standpoint of, you know, getting to build something like that, you know, and then we, not only that, we built the corridor, we built the, the transporter room. We were going to build, we, well, we built some Klingon sets. Um, we built a captain's quarters, like, you know, and, and I mean, eventually we were hoping to build, you know, medical everything, you know, like we would have, basically built the entirety of those original Desilu sets. Like that was the goal. And that was, I mean, it was a little daunting, but also, you know, what a fun thing to build. I, I was really looking forward to it. And, you know, when we finally got to do it, it was very exciting. Um, yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm not sure. <laughs> not sure where to go from there. Um, uh, so, but initially, you know, there wasn't any hesitation for me at all. Like, I really wanted to do this, and Alec was a good friend at that point. Um, wasn't until later that you know we, uh, well, issues came up for sure. But um, plus, I had the chance initially to work with the guy who built the Babylon Five sets. That was exciting too. Um, I, I knew I was going to learn a lot from him, and even though we weren't together for very long, I definitely did. Um, you know, it's just something. You know, if you're in a skills trade, you always want to be working with people who know more than you. You know, you always want to be learning. And so that was a neat opportunity, too. Um, and I will say, too, you know, uh, it was a low budget uh, film, obviously, and I was used to that. I, I had never had the opportunity to actually be qualified to join any of the film unions, um, which is it's, it's that's not an easy process at all. Uh, so I was used to working low budget. And um, my rate was $150 a day for uh, it was 10 to 12 hours, uh, which that's not abnormal in, uh, in, in the low-budget world. I've worked on a lot of uh, commercials and you know, music videos and those sorts of things, and that's a pretty common rate. Um, and just both the challenge and what it was, it was worth. It was worth that, that rate. It was worth the 70-mile one-way drive a day. Uh, it was worth the fact that we, we didn't have air conditioning in that building. You know, it wasn't a, a finished building. It was a warehouse, you know, uh, eventually we were, there were plans to have that, but you know, it was hot. It was muggy. It was, you know, if you walked away from your fan, you were kind of dying. It was, it was a little rough, <laughs> but, uh, was it fun? Was it worth it? Yeah. I, I absolutely, I, 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 it, it's one of those, like, I regret doing it because of all that's happened since, but I don't because I, I did enjoy the process and I'm very proud of what we did. Um, I, I wish we could have done the feature. That would have been amazing. Uh, but now, well, here we are. <laughs> it's been interesting, Dean, looking at what has been happening with Axanar and we're slowly moving through the timeline uh, of what's been happening. So at the moment where we're at the point now of, of the lawsuit, We've done all of this work uh, in the uh, in the LA studio, um, and Alec gets hit with this lawsuit, <clears throat> and suddenly money starts drying up for him. Uh, even though he's got lawyers uh, working on pro bono, somehow all of this money that he's raised is evaporating. Uh, he's got this warehouse that he was told uh, by people like Christian Gossett that it wasn't such a good idea. Nonetheless, it's here. It's being built. It's half built out, um, and. 
a post from you a couple of days ago um, in response to Alec on social media talking about how they really want a transporter set. You just talked about that, um, saying that you were you were <laughs> building one. There was one there. Uh, and, in fact, there was also 90% of the flats needed to build the entire corridor set. Uh, what happened to all of these uh, in that time of the of the lawsuit, and 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 afterwards as well, of course. The decision was made uh, because of the cost, the ongoing costs of the the building he was in. He couldn't afford it anymore. The money was gone. That uh, they were going to move to Georgia. There was that a last ditch effort. There was some sort of um, fundraiser at Indiegogo, or I'm not sure what GoFundMe. I don't recall. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yep. where he tried to raise, I think, $60,000 to try to, quote, save the studio. Um, what's interesting, though, and, and I'm, I'm not 100% sure on this, I'll be honest, uh, but I was looking through my messages because when this came up, it, it, it just something struck me as interesting. I went back through my messages, and near as I can tell, I believe they had already destroyed uh, the transporter set uh, prior to that fundraiser. I think it was already gone. So had they saved the studio as they wanted to, uh, that set was still destroyed. And, and I'll, I'll be honest, uh, the bridge is amazing. I love it. But the transporter room was, was my favorite of the pieces we, we made. It wasn't as big, but it was a huge challenge. Uh, I mean, it just sort of from a carpentry point of view, wood does not like to be round. And, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, so... Uh, everything about that, it, it was a huge challenge. It was something that I had to design myself. Um, I had to draw up blueprints, you know, that, you know, I, I'll be honest, my blueprints are an absolute mess. I understand them, and but I wouldn't want to hand them to somebody else. But that, that was work, and that was hours. And, you know, a lot of that I did at home, too, because I was just, I was really on top of this project. I, I wanted to to build a really good, you know, product, you know. And um, that transporter room was, was just an absolute it was a labor of love. You know, I, I, I built a lot of that myself along with my partner, Dominic and, uh, Jared hunt helped out a, a bit on that too. And it was a blast. And then a uh, Robert, uh, Meyer Burnett, he, he posted pictures of the, uh, we, because, uh, the lenses they use, you know, for the transporter pads, uh, they're from these old time lights that aren't really in use in Hollywood anymore. So, uh, like I had created a CAD file uh, and we had a, a CNC shop actually in the parking lot uh, where the action, our studio was uh, create a, uh, a, a frontal lens out of three quarter inch plywood or sorry, a uh, flexi uh, using my file. And uh, you can see in those photos, you know, RMB is having a lot of fun because it was just a cool thing. Like you, we put a light underneath and it looked, it looked, it was exactly what, you know, we wanted. It was great. And, um, was really excited about what that that set was going to become and it's in a garbage dump somewhere now and then you mentioned the corridor uh the corridor means a little bit to me not a little bit actually a lot because that a uh, few months of that summer my son actually came out there with me and uh he built most of those flats himself like uh, we we showed him how to do it and uh he got to work, and uh, I don't remember the exact count, but I mean there were basically two, six, seven, maybe eight foot stacks of these four by ten, you know, flats that were needed for this corridor, along with the other various sizes, you know, because you know the corridor makes some turns and corners and things, and so we needed you know some three foot, some two foot, various sizes, and he built virtually all of them himself, like, and they were nice, they were very nice. These were brand new flats. I, I was trying to, after all of this came up, I was trying to find like w find out how much a new flat would actually cost, like if you would just purchase one outright. Uh, and unfortunately, all these companies are like they'll give you an estimate, but they won't like just list a price online. But uh, he was selling those things for twenty bucks a piece, and I, I can just tell you for sure, the material alone is far more than twenty dollars a piece. The labor far more than twenty dollars. Um, when and those like i said those were nice they could have at the very least he could have sold them for a lot more than twenty dollars and recouped some losses there um the transporter room though complete loss total loss and i it'd be hard for me to put an estimate on it but i mean twenty five thousand thirty thousand dollars 
probably between material and labor, just completely just cut up and thrown in the trash. Yeah. In the trash. What does that, how does that make you feel? It's infuriating. I mean, that, that was my favorite set. It was, uh, like I said, a labor of love. It was also, I'm not, not to sound arrogant, but it was beautiful. I was very proud of it. Uh, we never got to see it, you know, fully dressed. We didn't get to, you know, we didn't get to put the, the cool lights and things in there. We didn't, you know, get to paint it fully. But at the end of the day, it, it would have been amazing. It would have looked great on camera. Everybody was excited about it. Robert really wanted to shoot on it. Uh, it, I'm, it would have appeared somewhere in the first half of the script. And I think it got a little more play in the second half, which, you know, because we were, we were initially aiming for that first half of the script. That's, that's what Rob, Rob had prepared uh, the VFX shots for. And uh, that was about the, how much budget we had, I think, at that point. Um, so I was excited. I was excited to see that thing, you know, be used. Uh, you know, actors on there. Um, it would have been amazing. Like, I mean, we were, we were making Star Trek. We thought, you know, we really did. Like, at least it felt like it. And, um, you know, I think everybody's seen that work. Everybody's seen Rob's work. You know, everybody knows that we were very serious about what we were doing and mm. um, trying to put together the best product we possibly could. So Alec moves, packs up, moves to Georgia. Um, and that obviously now makes it a little bit further than 70 miles one way for you to get to the studio. <laughs> Is that sort of where your Axonar journey came to an end? There was one more time I worked for him on Axonar, and that was once those sets had been uh, sent to Georgia. Uh, he wanted to do a gathering uh, just for people that were going to be in Georgia for, for Dragon Con. And... Uh, of course, I felt a responsibility to those sets. They're, they were my babies. And uh, uh, he asked me to come out there for about a week early uh, before Dragon Con to put the, put the bridge back together. And uh, we, we did a little bit extra. We, we painted some pieces that hadn't been painted before, like the, um, uh, the chair, the captain's chair, as well as the, uh, the consoles, uh, that, the ones that sit there in the lower area of the bridge. Uh, so it would be the, let me try to remember what they're supposed to be. Uh, one was tactical. One was, I'm not sure what the one on the right is supposed to be near the front. And then you had the helm as well. This is a, so we put the first coat of paint on the, on it, you know, that week prior to that gathering. And then a bunch of our friends from uh, the colonial fleet and some other people, you know, we had a little barbecue and uh, you know, there's some photos of that online. It was a lot of fun. Um, but that's pretty much the last time. I think that is the last thing I actually did on Axonar other than I handed off to them uh, all of my blueprints, all of my files, all of the the research I had done. Uh, uh, you know, like there's a lot of stuff online as well as um, some blueprints we acquired. Uh, we, we've got a couple pages from James Colley that was very helpful, and um, you know, he he allowed us to have copies of that. Uh, and then because of all the auctions, Alec had um, a lot of scans of the blueprints, you know, that he sold over the years, which were extremely helpful because uh, we were trying to make things as accurate as possible. So I, you know, I threw all of that onto their, I think it was their Google Drive or Dropbox, whatever it was. And I'm pretty sure that was the last thing I ever did as far as Axonar goes. And you're now the subject of a lawsuit uh, with Alec suing you. Uh, <laughs> how, how did that all come about? What, what, what is he suing you for? What happened to this 15-year friendship that just has just evaporated? Well, I, I'll just a minor correction. I'm not currently being sued. I'm under threat of being sued again. I I have been sued. My company, the Prop Lock, has been sued. My business partner, Jared Hunt, who also used to work for Alec, has been sued. Um, at this point, uh, I've been dismissed from that case because he incorrectly filed a case on me in Nevada. I live in California, and so uh, that went away. Uh, it cost me a considerable amount of money though, to basically just go into court and prove I don't live in Nevada. And here's the thing. It's absurd because he knows I don't live in Nevada because he served me. His process server came to my doorstep in California to serve me with a lawsuit in Nevada. And, um, as anybody know, anybody that's been following this, you know, ridiculousness, uh, he did the same thing to Robert Meyer Burnett. He sued him in Georgia even though he, of course, knew that Rob lives in California. Um, it is our absolute belief that 
he is just doing this knowing for several reasons that he can't actually sue us in California, that he sues us in these other states, not because it's going to go anywhere, but because it's going to cost us money to make this go away as punishment for his imagined crimes that we've all committed. He's been on live streams gloating about that as well, about how it just costs, uh, I think it was the Rob Burnett one, where it actually cost him $30,000 just to prove that he doesn't live in Georgia and he had to do all of that work. Um, it really comes down to spitefulness and, and pettiness on Alex's part and the Paul Jenkins and the Into the Wormhole documentary have put together a bit of a supercut on their YouTube channel about all the times, just in recent times, that Alec has gloated about right. suing people for the sake of suing people and um, and lamenting the fact that his girlfriend will only let him sue one person at a time. It's <laughs> what, what, what do you make of that? He was your friend for a decade and a half. He, he's obviously now not. Um, did were there right. any signs of this sort of behavior from Alec or uh, I guess we should get into the history of it a little bit. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be very straight and just say um, How long have we got? How long have we I'm got? Not, <laughs> <laughs> I I'm not proud of this. Um over the years, uh I've witnessed everyone that's worked for him witnessed uh we'll just we'll just call it shady behaviors, shady um, business practices and things, you know, and reality is being friends with Alec, working for Alec, doing things with Alec at conventions was fun. It was cool. Benefits came with, with being associated with Alec. You got to meet cool people. You got to go to cool places. I got to go to New York. You know, I, I got to meet Grace Park, you know, from Battlestar Galactica, who I have an infamous crush on. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, uh, we got to, like I mentioned earlier, I got to like touch actual Iron Man armor, you know, like there were, there were, so, you know, again, I'm not proud of this, but, uh, it was easy to overlook some things, unfortunately, because out of selfishness, and I think many people can say this, uh, because, Hey, he's screwing somebody else. And, and a famously one of his uh, little minions said this recently, he's never done me any wrong. So what do I care? And that was my attitude. And I think that's been the attitude of a lot of people. He never did anything to me. Um, so for me, the final straw of our friendship and, uh, all of it was uh, twofold. It was the ridiculous lawsuit he dropped on Tiana Armstrong and hero prop, which we were associated with because we were part of the same business deal that he sued her for. But also in the midst of all of that, I found out about Kathy Hutzel. I found out that he had kept uh, approximately $95,000 of the money that he owed her from the consignments that she had done. And, and this, uh, there were two things in particular that came up. There may be more, but I, but the ones I'm aware of are the uh, TOS Enterprise model that was featured in Trials and Tribulations, the DS9 episode, as well as one of the Orbs of the Prophets. Um, the, um, he did pay her some of the money he owed, but he owed her $95,000 beyond what he paid her. And this was money that he had been paid. Uh, the checks have been produced online. The evidence has been produced online. He received every penny that he was owed and that Kathy was owed. And in his deposition, he admitted he simply just didn't pay her. Um, where did that money go? I don't know. I can only assume he, uh, he spent it on himself. He spent it on his own expenses. But he didn't pay her, and he still hasn't as far as I know. Uh, but that was it. That was the line. I was finally outraged enough by his behavior. And again, like I said, I'm not proud of the fact that I didn't hit that line before. I should have. I really should have. But $95,000 to the widow of Gary Hutzel is insane. And so that's when I started speaking out. That's what, at, Sometime prior to that, I, I believe I joined AXA Monitor, probably around the time Tiana got sued. I started talking about things. And of course, uh, I was the primary person interviewed by Carlos uh, in the Kathy Hutzel uh, article, 
that he produced. Uh, the day before that article came out, he sent Jared and I both an email that said, basically, I'm going to sue you if you're named in that article. And eventually, of course, he did. Um, and uh, that was also just kind of a side note. That was one of the emails along with several others because he's threatened me many times through email and through Facebook messages, et cetera, with a, a variety of things, wanting me to shut up, um, threatened to talk to my family, threatened to talk to my children, et cetera. I, I finally got fed up when he actually addressed, you know, mentioned my children. Uh, this was recent too. This was uh, last couple months, I think. Um, I took all of that to the police. I was absolutely just completely fed up with his threats, with his, uh, what I believe are attempts at extortion. Um, and I sat across the desk from this officer and I was like, what can we do about this? And the thing he said, and this is infuriating too, because other people have had this same experience. Um, the officer said, the problem here is this, because I, I mentioned that he was a lawyer by training. Um, he uses weasel words. He, he, he words things in a way so that, you know, there's a question mark at the end. What if I did this? What if I did that? Because he knows if he outright said, like, if he outright threatened to do this or that, that would be provable extortion. But no, he words it in a way so that you go to law enforcement, they're like, well, you're right. This is an attempt at extortion, but the way he words it, we can't act on it legally, making it a civil matter. And it's sickening. It's sickening because we know mm. through all these various lawsuits, you know, the way he punishes people with the law, that he knows how to use the law. He knows how to use these loopholes. He knows how to use the weaknesses in our law system to just absolutely wreck people's lives, absolutely hurt people's lives. Um, I've been not asked. I've been asked not to get into specifics, but my my former business partner Jared Hunt was driven into bankruptcy. Our company was driven into bankruptcy. I, I won't get into the numbers, but they were substantial. And for what? Uh, because he thinks he's owed money on a business deal that he had literally no part in. And the really annoying thing for me is the fact that he gets away with it. Um, and clearly he's enabled by the legal system in America to be able to do all of this. And, and, and this is his weapon to, um, to shut down those people that he thinks betray him uh, and those people that move on. And um, me saying these things will probably mean what I said at the top of the show of us waiting for him to, uh, to put some time in his schedule. I don't think he's going to do that now, but the truth <laughs> has to be out there. Um, the, the the pattern of force is there. There's these posts on AXA Monitor that go back 20 years, 20 plus years to the original bulletin boards of the internet in those days where he was carrying on in the same behaviours. He hasn't learned in the 20 years since. He, he's been the same person. He came on this show and tried to tell me how to do things uh, back in 2016 <laughs> um, as a benevolent uh, sort of overlord. And a few people have tried that uh, since, and, uh, and I've learned from those experiences. But it's, it's just so infuriating that he can get away with this, uh, and he does it every time. And it seems to be his way of, uh, of, of operating. It's his modus operandi. Um, and, uh, and he, he clearly gets away with it and he clearly has enablers, uh, on his side of the fence to use one of his terms. Um, they're over there supporting him. They're in, uh, this, you know, what I believe, uh, is, is cult mentality in the way that he's protected mm. uh, by those people that are, are around him. Um, and there doesn't seem to be an end in sight, um, except when people finally see the light, move on, and then they look back on it like you've done, Dean, today and go, crap, all that happened. And I didn't think of it at the time. Um, he does have this aura about him. Um, and that's the one thing I'll give him credit for. He has that ability to suck people in with the benefits that come with being a friend. You know, it was even said to me on Twitter recently, um, as recently as a few days before we were recording, uh, that he is a loyal friend. I'm reading the tweet now. Um, and he's been extremely helpful and supportive uh, of um, these people that I've been talking about. And I won't name names, won't go into that, but 
there are some people that I had, you know, do some amazing work. Um, they they do their own fan film, um, and they've joined with Axana and Alec. I said because of Reach, and the reply was that he is helpful, supportive, and quite a loyal friend. Uh, from your perspective, Dean, being uh, having been there with Alec, um, do you believe that's the case? No, he's he's a loyal friend as long as you're useful. That that's my that's my opinion, and I think it's it is absolutely borne out by what we've seen. Um, there is a notorious list that a particular hater. Uh, keeps uh, uh, it's I've lost count of the names I'm going to say it's about 50 names off, and uh, it's people that used to be his friends used to work with him mm. um, some people very close to him some people in relationships with him who will never work with him who don't want anything to do with him and uh, I guess the the question that is just absolutely begged there is who's the problem is it that long list it's like, you know, one, one thing I, I, something I've talked about with a few people a lot is this, um, the, the word enemy, you know, is, you know, if you really consider what the word enemy means, that is a very dramatic word. Mm. You know, my entire life, my entire life, I've had people I didn't get along with. I've been in fistfights. I used to play hockey, Matt. Like, you know, <laughs> I've, I've drawn blood. I have had drawn blood, you know, had blood drawn from me, you know? And never in my entire life have I thought of anyone as an enemy. Um, and Alec is, to me, literally an enemy. And, and that, that's, it's silly. It's absurd. And I, I would venture to say there's a lot of people on that long list who would consider him an enemy. You know, not just somebody they don't like, not just somebody they've had some opposition with. Actual, literal enemy. And everything that goes along with that, you know? Um, and I, I don't understand. I don't understand how one person can be at the center of all of this, of all of that. It, it, it's, and it's, I think, particularly telling. You mentioned those posts that have been coming to light recently from 20, 30 years ago. It is precisely the exact same behavior, and it's shocking. I, I can tell you for sure, 30 years ago, I was not the same person I am now. You know, everything about me, my maturity, my beliefs, uh, my politics, you name it, is very different. Very, very different. You know, I also weigh 20 more pounds, but, you know, <laughs> like I'm a different person, you know? Yeah. Apparently he's not. Apparently he's not. And I, I, it, that's mind boggling um, that you, you see those posts, you see him threatening to sue people. Yeah, and, and also, hilariously, uh, it seems that those people, very much like Axa Monitor, spend a lot of time making fun of just how absurd this person is, which, I mean, you know, for us, very enjoyable. Uh, but also, I, I, there's a pattern there, and it's like he does outrageous things, and he ends up the subject of criticism, and then he threatens to sue people. And nowadays, he does, uh, but at the end of the day, he ends up the subject of ridicule because his behavior is ridiculous. It's a topic that I never thought that I would be covering so consistently <laughs> um, when I started podcasting eight years ago. Uh, but here we are five years on from that law lawsuit, five years on from those guidelines, 15 years on from your friendship with him um, and still this same person. Nothing has changed in the time that I've covered Axana. Um, <laughs> It, it, it beggars belief. The fact that he's now following, he's emboldened uh, now and he's following through with these lawsuits and he's done it twice now to people in uh, filing suits against them in incorrect states, costing them money to go to mm -hmm. courts. Um, he's an abuser of the court system, uh, absolutely 100%. He owes money to people. Uh, and there'll be comments on this video and there'll be discussion on of this podcast on those groups on Facebook about how this isn't true. None of this is factual. Dean, you're a hater. You never actually believed in the Yaxanar film. All these sort of things will come out. They <laughs> always come out. Whenever I interview someone else with uh, that has left Axanar, I interviewed Tony Todd and they managed to find things to rile against him for. Tony Todd, the candy man, they had a problem with. Yes. They didn't have a problem with him when he was on the show, but since he said, you're all fucked, Pardon the French. 
he has turned into <laughs> public enemy number one. And it was really funny because you asked me just before, can I swear? Well, I just dropped the F-bomb, so there it yeah. is. But that yeah, really you is <laughs> exactly right. But, I mean, that's that's the emotion that he elicits. Uh, and, you you know, you also get people as well to uh, – and, and, and I guess where I'm leading here with the question, Dean, is – some other people will comment and say, who cares? It's a niche of a niche. He is a nobody. He's not making enough money for anybody to care. Clearly, CBS and Paramount don't care about him because they're not suing him for those continued breaches of the settlement agreement that they signed with him. Uh, should we still care, Dean? Should we just ignore him and let him fade into obscurity? Or is it sort of incumbent on us, having had the experience, to try and warn others. I, I think we definitely do. And I, I guess full disclosure, I have interviewed with Paul Jenkins for the Into the Wormhole inter a documentary. Um, I'm a part of that effort. I have provided for him um, not just the interview, but, you know, emails, et cetera, you know, documentation about all of these things. Um, and yes, uh, the fact of the matter is because we we those emails going or sorry those messages from Usenet or AOL or wherever they came from go going so far back we see this pattern of behavior we've seen this going on and just in the time period when he's been involved in the prop community I mean the the Jason DeBoard you know lawsuit that he lost uh, that was I'm not sure how many years ago now but you know like no this is not the first time this has happened and I don't know I don't know much about Jason I know he's a collector uh, I don't know. If he's wealthy or if he's, you know, I have no idea. I don't know what that lawsuit cost him, but I'll bet it was a bunch. And uh, he ultimately won. So, you know, it, we just, we see this pattern, you know, uh, my my familiarity with uh, him and the Jason DeBoard lawsuit and, you know, just moving forward and all those old messages. Um, he's not, he's not done. He, he's going to sue somebody else. He's how many people is he threatened to sue? You know, on Axe Monitor alone. Uh, I mean, he may sue Carlos at some point. Who knows? He's threatened it how many times? Mm. Uh, he's now involved in a, a legal issue with you know Sean O'Halloran because of that thing that happened at you know Dragon Con. Uh, I mean, that's a little bit different than these other lawsuits, but uh, it's just an ongoing thing. It, it, it's it, litigious. I, I I don't know what else to call him. It, it's crazy. I mean, I've been I've been involved with two lawsuits my entire life. The one he sued me in and my divorce. That's it. And I hope I never have to do it again. You know, I hope there's there's never another one, you know? Like, how many has he been involved in? I have no idea. Um, so yeah, is it worth pursuing? Is it worth to you know continue talking about this? Yes, absolutely. Because there will be other victims. And if there's some way legally Financially, I, I don't know. There's some way that he can be prevented from hurting more people for no reason whatsoever. None. Like, you know, the thing he accuses of, we did not do the thing he's accused us of. Tiana Armstrong did not do what he's accused her of. Didn't stop him from suing her. Didn't stop her from having to pay. I don't even know how much money to defend herself. Um, and as you mentioned in that that little clip, you know, that that Paul put together, He's proud of it. He says something to the effect of, it probably cost her $100,000. Good. Yeah. Teach her a lesson. Who talks like that? Yeah. What, what insane person talks like that? I, 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 yeah, there's people I've been angry at over the years that I really wish karma would hit. But whatever. You move on. You know? And, uh, you know, and the thing is, too, like my case in particular, because he has said... I don't know. The number keeps changing. Like he sued Jared and I for, I think it was $280,000 was the amount, if I remember correctly. Um, he says very regularly that we stole, not, no, I don't, not, I don't know. That's the word, you know, cheated, I don't know, outmaneuvered, whatever. No, stole, stole $150,000 from him. That's the number he says online regularly. And here's why, yes, this is worth talking about and why it's important. Because even when he's proven completely wrong, and, and, I, and I say that because I got tired of him saying, repeating this $150,000 lie, because I knew it was a lie, you know, not to mention the 280 or whatever it was he actually sued us for, this $150,000 lie. So uh, not that long ago, I actually produced my tax records online. 
And th this was 2018 when this supposed $150,000 was stolen from him. Uh, and the entirety of the money I made that year, including the deal he sued us over, as well as the rest of the money I made, was uh, roughly $53,000. That's all the money I made that entire year. Of that $53,000, I made $39,000 from the deal that he sued us from. There was no math equation in the world that turns $39,000 into a half of or a complete amount of $100,000. The number, it, it didn't happen. Our company did not even make that much money total that year. We, I mean, I, I think our whole, I think our company made $96,000 total that year. But even after being presented with the K-1, he comes at me, his response was, well, now I know how much to sue you for. <laughs> not, not a retraction, not a oops, well, maybe I got this wrong. He didn't step back and go like, oh, wait, maybe I made a mistake here. Oh, no, 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 no. He intends to sue me again for, I don't, I don't even know how much now. Is it the 39000 Is it the 52000 Is it the, the 95000 our company made? I have no idea. Because right after that, days after that, he again started repeating the $150,000 number. And we still, we to this day, do not know where that number came from. We have no idea. Not to mention the 280000 We have no idea. And in the... <laughs> And I like that you're laughing because I mean you see how absurd this is. Like yeah. when, so, and and the thing is too, like me presenting my K one. I know you're in Australia, Matt, so you may not know what that document is, but it's basically it's a document you submit to the IRS. You know, when you're a business owner, that you know tells them how much you made, how much taxes you either paid or are owed, etc. That was sent to the IRS. They have this document. Um, so unless he's accusing me of tax fraud. You know, like that's the amount of money we made. That's it. So I don't know. Maybe that's you know, after I now I said that that's probably the next accusation. I don't know, because, <laughs> you know, it, it never ends. It just never ends, you know, and I guarantee you, you know, I don't know. He's been quiet lately. And I think that has to do some has something to do with the, the O'Halloran incident. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. He sees this podcast. He's probably going to talk about the hundred fifty thousand dollars again because, you know, He's one of those guys. He just repeats a lie over and over and over again. And it is a lie. And I'll, I'll just say too, like we, we tried to figure out where did that 280, where did that $150,000 come from? Because when he sued us, he sent all these check stubs to our lawyer as if it was some sort of proof that uh, we made all this money. But here's the thing. The money we made with Tiana, first of all, we did a lot of business with Tiana. Like we we did a eBay auction for Tiana on behalf of Tiana. She was our consigner uh, for the movie Logan Lucky, the Daniel Craig and um, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, Kylo Ren, Adam Driver. Adam you know, Lucky. fun movie by the way. Didn't make a lot of money, but uh, T Tiana got the assets and and we did an eBay auction. We made some money off of that. I don't remember how much. One of those check stubs was that. That certainly had nothing to do with what he sued us over. Uh, we did a, a, a eBay. A, 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 we did another auction on I Collector at the end of uh, 2018 or 2019. Um, that was one of the check stubs. Does he think he's owed money from auctions that he wasn't a part of? Apparently, so he had he produced all these check stubs again as some sort of proof that we owe him all this money. Like, it, it's 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 insane. It's absurd. Um, and. So I, I don't know, I guess getting back to the point, yes, this guy needs to be stopped. He needs to stop hurting people. He's hurt me. He's hurt my business partner far more. He's hurt, hurt Tiana. I don't know how much, but he's, he may be right about that $100,000. I don't know. Lawsuits are expensive. And he tr tried to push her as far as he could. Uh, some sort of settlement, settlement agreement came about. I don't know the details of that, so I, I can't speak to that. But clearly it cost her a lot of money. And, and and also too, like it is our belief that he his lawyer, again, this is a my belief, our belief, many people's belief, he's writing the legal documents, is, is our belief. We believe that he's the one that's actually conducting these cases, and then he has a lawyer that puts a stamp of a stamp on it. So the costs to Alec compared to the costs to everybody else 
are substantially smaller. So that's how, again, we believe. Okay, I don't, I don't want to, you know, libel, slander, whatever he's going to accuse me of. But, um, you know, and some of that is based on the fact that the way he writes things online seem to parallel the way these legal documents are written, misspellings, et cetera. Um, <laughs> which, you know, I mean, lawyers tend to not misspell, actual lawyers tend to not misspell things, yeah, you know? Exactly. I mean, I mean, oh my God, just, just use your spell checker for real. Thanks. Like yeah. everybody has that, right? Um, so I don't know, maybe we're, we're kind of getting off onto a tangent, but you know, like he conducts these lawsuits for a fraction of the cost everybody else does. That seems to be clear because I mean, I think we're all vaguely sort of aware of how much money he makes now, right? It doesn't seem to be much. Yeah. He doesn't have an actual job. He's living off of donors to this day and off his merchandise. And he's produced more merchandise recently. Merchandise that he was forbidden to sell at Dragon Con, but he did anyway. I mean, we know this because there are witnesses to it. Because everyone else was doing it, Dane. He right. actually said that Which, to Dragon you know Con. It, I, I got to say, you know, like, unfortunately, that's a kind of a potent argument because I, I, I would did go through that vendor hall. Yeah, there's a lot of I mean, that's kind of par for the course at every convention I've ever been to, to be honest, you know, yeah, exactly. But nevertheless, I mean, he's not just forbidden from Dragon Con from selling that stuff. He was forbidden in the CBS settlement as well. And I think that's the you point know, as well is, is the fact that just because everyone else is doing it doesn't make it right for you because you've actually been told that you can't do it. Uh, everyone else will in need to seek In a federal seek, court seek of law. Yeah. Everyone else <laughs> yeah. needs to seek forgiveness, right. not ask permission. He has no permission. He can't seek forgiveness. So it, it certainly is a very interesting one. As you say, there, there are so many machinations <laughs> involved in Alec Peters. Um, and the one true yes. person that I would love on this show in that box uh, on that graphic is him himself so that I could ask these questions. He won't do it. And I think that uh, him saying yes to me was a way of trying to get, uh, trying to lure me in. I, I have no idea. I'm not even going to try and enter into his mind. Uh, but that's probably where we're going to put a pin in today's podcast, Dean. It's uh, been a fascinating chat with you to to listen to your journey from a, a friend to a colleague to an employer to someone that is threatening to sue you because reasons um just incredible i really appreciate your time today i really appreciate you opening up uh to the show uh and hopefully uh people can take away from this what we're hoping that they will take away dean newberry thanks for beaming in for this edition of a track sound conversation uh thanks for your time matt i appreciate it i i hope uh i didn't ramble too much i do tend to do that i know so uh, uh <laughs> not at all thanks thanks thank you very much <laughs>